All right, I think we can start. Ash, can you hear me? Yep. Uh, so, welcome everyone on the Contributor Experience Matters. Sharon wasn't here, unfortunately, to uh, uh, introduce us and welcome. Uh, uh, she ap apologized, uh, she has an exam, so we have to introduce ourselves. Uh, so let me introduce Ash, uh, Ash uh, Berlin Tyler. He's uh, one of the, mm, hmm, how to say, the longest committers or longest time committers uh, at Apache Airflow and PMC member. When I came to the project, Ash was already a, a long timer. So, so he has a lot of experience with uh, with Apache Airflow. Thank you. Yes, and uh, let me also introduce Yarek. Um, Yarek has been a great help on the Apache Airflow project. Um, kind of different background to most most of the rest of the developers. He's also on, on the PNC, um, and he has put far more time than anyone ever deserves um, into our whole CI build process, trying to greatly improve the experience of you know our contributors. Um, so I guess kind of. Uh, the remote thing. Mm, okay, so I'll I'll just uh, I'll just move forward. Cool. So you start. Yes. So. Um. Ooh, I can still see slide one. Technology, technology is wonderful. Um. So yeah. Um. Well. We work out the technology. I was just kind of talking. Uh, so Apache Airflow, um, for anyone who doesn't know, it is a workflow orchestration system. Uh, um, it originally came out of Airbnb in 2015. I think the very start of very end of 2014, 2015. Um, kind of joined Apache as an incubating project in 2014. Uh, sorry, 2016. Um, and became a top level project at the end of 2018, December 2018. Um, so yeah, we are a Python project, which I guess kind of makes us a little different from most Apache projects, ASF projects, which historically have all been Java. Um, maybe not relevant, but one of the things that kind of this matters is we have a large matrix of tests to support um, and obviously kind of open source projects we need because we just can't do regression tests we don't have the time or resources to do anything like that um and yeah so kind of like this is going to be a little bit little bit of a story about how we on the apache project kind of encourage people to punch you and how and what worked for us this is not a is what you need to do to make your project work this is clearly just Here's the things we think about that we think are important. A little bit about how we did some of them and just kind of an indication of, um, yeah, it worked for us as kind of, as of about two weeks ago, um, Airflow has the most number of contributors for an ASF project. So yeah, we just hit that at, at Spark with um, about 10 more, we're at 1,730 contributors, which is, it's nice. Because community matters. That's kind of what we're all about as an open source project. So over to you, Yarek. OK. So uh, just uh, just uh, to show to show the, the, the image here, the, we uh, right now, uh, I just compared how the number of commits change, how number of authors change. So we have uh, quite a lot of committers, quite a lot of commits, 135 authors. Uh, in August, uh, between August and September, so 100 authors before it grows, the same with commits, number of commits grows, and we have to handle that. So a little bit about like, what are contributions and what is the landscape of contribution? What are the types of code, code contributions? Because as we all know uh, from, from many other talks, we have different kinds of contributions. They don't have to be a code contributor. So there are lots of people who are not committing code and they are really helpful and useful uh, in the community uh, and they are committers and PMC members. But here we are going to talk about just the code contributors. And uh, But even be between code contributions and the people who are 
code contributors, there are different kinds of uh, people, different uh, different types of people. So uh, like me and uh, uh, Ash, we are a little bit uh, seasoned regular committers who <laughs> do work uh, all the time on Airflow and spend most of our time uh, on Airflow. We have also committers who are occasionally returning and coming back and doing this uh, less, fre less, frequent, less frequently, but still they are returning and they know the staff. There are some people who are very, very frequent contributors, uh, maybe like like us with, uh, with, our, with me and Ash, uh, but there are also so, sometimes users who are one-time contributors who just contribute like one thing because they want to get a fix something that they've done for their own installation and they want to contribute it and they just want to contribute this one thing and they will never return this happens uh, there are people who are improving documentation uh we have so there are some people who just only uh, contribute documentation and we sometimes even you know like look up yeah. okay this contribution like just just spelling mistakes but they are also important and and people are are, are into that and our documentation gets better and there are also though those kind of contributors and this is the important uh, piece here that those contributors they have very little programming experience they want to learn they want to implement just a small change and then want just want to uh, just wants to implement it very quickly uh, and why uh, and I think it's good to talk about like what are, what is the motivation of those people who are contributing uh, so because this is important to know, how to respond to them. So as Ash mentioned, we became the, uh, the project for from the ISF, which has the most number, the biggest number of contributors. I think we are doing some things right in the sense that, that really a lot of people are contributing stuff to, uh, to, to our project. And in order to let them contribute, to make it easier for them to contribute, we need to understand uh, what is their motivation, what they want to achieve, like why they want to contribute, what's the kind of circumstances, uh, and to make it easier for all the different kinds of circumstances. Uh, so for experienced people who know the project well, who are vested, who are often paid, as we are both with, with Ash paid to do our job, uh, there are other people who are paid. There are also those occasional committers who uh, just want to get their problems fixed, uh, some consultants who implement changes for their uh, customers, they also also paid for, but they are not focusing on Airflow exclusively. Airflow is just part of what they are doing. Uh, so, so and, and they're very, very fresh uh, contributors who have different motivations. So the uh, they want to just learn things. They want to learn good practices. They want to participate in some popular project like OSS project like uh, which are popular and gain some experience from people like yeah, like Ash for example myself and others uh, uh, or another motivation they are just obsessed with typos so this is the so th those are the kind of people who like see okay I see I see a spelling mistake that here I want to correct it so there are, there are completely different motivations uh, of those people and and uh, for some projects or for some communities, you might think, okay, we just want to have those contributions which really matter. The big ones, the big changes, the, the kind of like big features that will be used by, by, by many people. But this is not really how it is. Uh, I think, and, uh, and I think it's, it has been proven for, for years uh, of work uh, in Airflow, like all contribution, contribut contributions matter, no matter how simple or complex they are, no matter if they are big or small, or they are, whether they are touching the core of the, of the product or some side stuff, or maybe even the tooling around that. It's great to have all the different kind, kind of contributions and everyone contributes to the healthiness of the project, to the, uh, to the future of the project. Uh, it's great to see different perspectives of different people. So you have these, these new people, we have these, these seasoned people, and we have people who have experience in programming, but we also have people who are very little experience or just uh, contributing documentation changes. And and they can give their own perspective, which might be different from, from our assumptions, um, our view of who are the committers there, uh, because we have all the assumptions in our heads when we when we just try to uh, to explain someone to, uh, to to our users by the documentation, for example, we just know everything. So I mean, it's it's obvious, and things are not obvious for for newcomers. Uh, and everyone, uh, ourselves, I learn, and the Ash, and everyone else working on the project will learn every day from seeing different perspectives. And this is the great part of community as well that 
that we learn from each other, no matter how experienced or inexperienced you are. Uh, this is this is really fantastic to see some people just, you know, I've learned literally yesterday, I've learned that there is a, uh, there is, you can pass uh, two, <laughs> two strings on start swift in Python, which I didn't know. It's just mentioned in like small, small one line in the documentation. And it's very useful. But somebody told me that, and uh, you know, I've, I've been working on that for quite some time. Uh, the typos, spelling mistakes are also kind of like annoying for, especially for people who have different perspective. I'm not a native speaker, so it does. It's not. It doesn't bother me that much. But for people like Ash, who is, uh, and for others, uh, Jet uh, in, in in our commuter team. Uh, it's like it just stands out and they see like immediately that there is a grammar mistake that should be corrected I don't and and that makes like listening to those people is actually great because I, I can learn as well and also uh, if people are committing the small things or documentation changes or or, or even like kind of side things the experienced commuters uh, who have experience and know the project inside out, they might focus on bigger things because others are implementing those simple things that are uh, that are also important, but they wouldn't have time for that. And by implementing those small things and just doing reviews of that, we have a lot more time to do this, this kind of complex uh, new features. Uh, we are just about to get uh, Airflow 2.2, like fantastic new features that uh, some experienced commuters, uh, uh, even new for Airflow, but experienced elsewhere are working. And, and they could do that because other people, they, they contributed a lot of improvements, small things. And also, uh, the diversity is important because inexperienced contributors might simply grow and become like really great and experienced commuters. And there is a great story, you can just read it on the success from uh, success uh, at apache blog which which Ephraim, uh member of uh, pmc member of airflow as of last month uh, he wrote uh, this, this fantastic blog there describing his story he started as an intern to p2 to, to airflow and uh, and learned how airflow works and became committer and then became after one and a half year uh, i became the pmc member and this is great story because just go go read it so there are different workflows of contributors, and this is something also very interesting uh, to understand uh, how those different contributor work for us to be able to respond to those the needs they have. So, so th those regular committers, they know their tools, they know their environment. They can focus on their work days, work for days and hours. They know all the tips and tricks. They know the rules uh, which are needed to contribute to, to the project. Uh, but those occasional committers, they're completely different. They, they really have to familiarize themselves with the environment, something that we take for granted because we work on it for weeks and years sometimes. They have to learn. And it turns out that it might be long time to learn uh, the whole environment. They have very short time to do the stuff usually. So they don't have time to set up the environment in exactly the way they want. They want just to get it working, contribute, and go do something else. They don't know the rules. <laughs> and that's that's the important thing. Like, like we have some rules to keep our project running. I'll show them in a moment. And any roadblock, roadblock which is there might stop, might simply stop them from contributing. But our project is like a huge project, uh, a lot of dependency. Uh, it has to be maintained. We have to think about our users in the future evolution. So we have a lot of expectations for the project. The project has to be maintained. We cannot afford bad quality code. Uh, and even the smallest contributions from those people who are just fresh and not very experienced, uh, it has to follow, fulfill all the requirements, automation, uh, of uh, that automated test formatting uh, rules that we have, uh, what, that we have. Uh, some common mistakes that we know we shouldn't make and and people can make and some best practices we are following the way how we are coding our stuff it has to be consistent and we have very limited number of committed committers to, to tell those that to those new people imagine we have this ash mentioned 1700 uh com contributors of course not of them commit uh, contribute at the same time but if a lot of them do we <laughs> explain and a lot new one a lot of new ones explaining these all rules to all of them would be uh completely uh impossible uh and those committers are busy adding new features as i mentioned before so we have 
And just to give you a little bit perspective on like how complex airflow are, are and what expectations we have, what different kinds of expectations we have. So we have like 70 PyPy packages published. So we have airflow providers, Python client, 70 packages is, is a lot. We have more than 500 dependencies. Uh, I was surprised to, when I checked yesterday that we have more than 9,500 PyTest tests. We have 70 plus static checks for consistency and best practices, uh, which are run on pre-commit, but also on the CI. We have four Python versions to support. We have four databases to support, uh, MySQL, Postgres, SQLite, and MSSQL experimental recently. <laughs> we have uh, literally millions of lines of generated documentation. I don't know how Sphinx does it, but from like not millions of code of, of, of documentation generates millions of lines of HTML code. Uh, it was surprising when I learned that. We have uh, provider packages. So we have these optional features of Airflow that you can add on top. And they have to build, they have to import on even older version of Airflows. And we have, we check that. We have we have to make sure that there, there is no warnings in those providers. We also have Docker images because we uh, have convenience binaries which we send to our users for easier installation of Airflow. And they have to build and they have to uh, have all the features that we think they, there should be in the production image. We have Helm chart for installing uh, Airflow with some tests, which test if they render correctly. So if you're using Kubernetes, you can still use it. We have a Kubernetes integration. We have Kind, which is a Kubernetes in Docker. This is the Kubernetes development environment for testing if Airflow installed on Kubernetes works, and it has to work. Every single commit is made. It has to continue to work. And we have like automated upgrade for latest dependencies and security Python releases. So I would refer to the talk which we just listens, listened. Most some of us listened about security where, uh, uh, at the keynote uh, today. Uh, we are one of those few projects which take care about upgrading their dependencies as we go. So like every single every single day we upgrade new dependencies. We have 500 of them and we just keep up with those, uh, with the base images, base Python AMA images and with those 500 dependencies. And we have to make sure that they continue work after the upgrade uh, because we automatically upgrade them. So how, how, how can we keep in order with 15 active committers uh, like, as you saw, 150 contributors last month and 350 commits last month. So what, how, what do we do? We do, we have a very comprehensive documentation, but you know, there are two kinds of people. They, those who read documentation and then the, those who do stuff. Uh, so there, there is an environment that uh, helps you, helps you to start develop an environment very easily. Uh, if, two kinds of the development environment. We have a quick start guide to tell you how to start Airflow, Airflow locally on the Python virtual environment or in Docker. Uh, we have some talks recording meetups, Airflow Summit a conference, which had like 10,000 people attendees uh, a few months back. Uh, we have actively recruit, we actively recruit people. This is an interesting one. So whenever people are asking us for help on Slack and Stack Overflow and, and elsewhere, we always ask them to contribute back to you know, improve the documentation of these and problems or uh, tell us like if something worked for them just to share it for others. So this, this is all things which we do continuously. We run workshops for new contributors and we have three workshops coming in September, October and December in Taiwan, in Mexico and Poland, so all over the world, where we teach people how to contribute. So we have this, this kind of uh, intro in three hours, like how you can, uh, how you can uh, work in the environment, in the open source environment, how you can contribute stuff. We actually choose the the, the task to work on uh, with those people and they are contributing that. And we had a number of PRs coming out of that as well. But there is one key component and that's, I'll just handle that to, to, to Ash after that. The key component that we want to talk about is, is like, which keeps that possible like how the hell with this 15 committers with 100, 150 committer contributors we just make sure that all the requirements that i mentioned before that we have for the project that are kept in check that are that, that, that are fulfilled so the key component we have is is the ci yeah so the ci uh, is the the one that lets us uh go get this number of committers with this number of contributors and with this uh with everything all the all the all the requirements of the of the project fulfilled and there are some few 
good CI characteristics that I'm always, uh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm in the CI business for like 20 something years. <laughs> I did CI when the CI term was not yet coined even. Uh, so the important things about the CI, it has to be seamless and transparent. So you shouldn't know that it exists until you need it, until the error is uh, flashed into your eyes, because then, then you should look at it, you can fix the problems, and then you, it should disappear. It should be transparent, and it should be seamlessly integrated with your development workflow. Uh, there should be low flakiness. We are not yet there. We are fighting with that. This is, this is something that, uh, that, that we actually uh, uh, try to fight continuously. But the most important part of the CI is the quick feed feedback time. So like how fast you can get the information that your change is not fulfilling all those uh, prerequisites, how fast you can get it working, yeah, get it confirmed or get your feedback. It works, it's green or it's red, you have to, you have to correct it. So we are using GitHub actions for that. Uh, and this is a GitHub actions is used by many other projects. And there are a number of challenges in there to and uh, and one of them is, is the one that we are going to talk about uh, in more detail in a moment our ash is gonna so we have github actions which are great they are not perfect they have excellent integration with github workflow uh, we really love to uh, how this is seamlessly integrated in the whole experience of development and it's going to be even better in the future with uh, with code spaces which are coming which will allow you to spin off the development environment inside the github this is something that we that i'm wait, waiting for uh, to enable it uh, and and the integration is just excellent like we used in the past others like travis and, and, and jenkins i used lots of different uh, ci systems and github actions are really great perfect integration they do evolve and they solve problems pretty fast so we had a problem with canceling duplicate jobs because by the way we were one of the first project which started using github actions in apache software foundation so uh, ash will tell a little bit about that in a moment but but we've been there from the very beginning when they they opened it up so we had problems with canceling duplicate jobs which was like I solved it initially and that was like terribly complex. It is solved. Uh, they, they, they have a simple way of doing that. They have a, uh, there were a problem with write access from fork pull requests. It's largely solved. It's a little bit complex, but it works. So you are not afraid that somebody will uh, mine Bitcoin in your, uh, in your, by, by using forks, uh, for example, or uh, uh, check or change your repository. There are some security issues with access actions, and they are also also largely solved. But the biggest challenge we have, and this is something that uh, that Ash is going to talk about, is the the feedback time. So the problem was that like we didn't have enough feedback time for reasons that Ash explains, and uh, how we are we targeted that as part of our improving uh, experience of the contributor. Um, so uh, yeah. Uh, so we have the number of jobs in the short queue uh, was the problem, but Ash will tell about that, about that. And we had some problems with security of private runners for public projects, which is going to be the part that Ash is going to talk about now. Yes. Um, so yeah, kind of when when Airflow started before it was Apache Airflow even. Um, Travis CI was sort of the de facto default that every every project used um, at that point. Travis still loved open source. They hadn't yet been bought out by private equity and driven into the ground. Um, sidebar, um, if, yeah, if you're on Travis, uh, time to move away. Um, they had a serious security thing where forks got access to secrets from the original pull request, and Travis tried to hide this. So. You're on Travis, time to migrate. Anyway, um, we were on Travis CI and sometime, oh, when was it? Sometime in 2020, um, Travis build time started going up. Um, similar problem. So kind of the ASF had to deal with Travis where we had a pool of, of, of job slots available and all projects using Travis in the ASF were kind of competing for that pool. Um, and this just showed up to us as Airflow developers as the job stuck in a queue for sometimes 18 hours, um, which when you want to release a version um, of a software and you're waiting 18 hours for feedback, um, that kind of takes the whole XKCD 
fighting in your chair with the excuse of it's compiling. Um, should have put that slide in here. Pretend there's that comic in here that we've all seen. Um, yeah, so that was just like, okay, this is just not working. Um, it, developing was painful. So we, um, yeah, we decided let's get have actions that kind of just been released. So we thought, right, okay, let's let's switch to that. Um, so we were one of the first projects to do it, and when we were the only people using GitHub Actions, everything was wonderful because we weren't competing with the queue for anyone. Um, but then my remote's working now, so I've got the slides. Um, but then lots of other projects realized the same thing, and then we had the same problem on on GitHub that we did on Travis. Um, there was lots of contention for the for the worker slots. Um, that your window showing up on the thing, Yarek. We got wind, we got wind. Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, so it's like, ah, uh, right, what do we do? Um, lots of kind of back and forth with the ASF infra team and GitHub support to just like work out what's going on. Um, eventually, yeah, it's okay, it's the key thing, right? So, like, what do we do? Um, and then we went, right. Uh, what do we do? So we did a lot. We did a lot of effort. I say we, mostly Yarek, did a lot of work to reduce our build times, reduce the amount of jobs we did, to see what we can do to speed things up. Um, but yeah, the problem problem is that the GitHub's GitHub Actions hosted runners, i.e., the ones hosted by GitHub themselves, are. I mean, they're free. So it's what you get for free is remarkably generous. Uh, Eight gig of RAM, two CPU. Um, but yes, our full matrix of jobs because we. Support of well, right now it's Python three five no sorry three six three seven three eight three nine for two versions of MySQL two versions of Postgres and two versions of MS SQL. Once you multiply all those out, you get my forty plus jobs plus there's then multiple versions. Of anyway, massive matrix. It kind of gets really big if you try to run it all, um, which we started doing because I mean, you know, it's better to run all the tests. But that didn't that didn't scale. Um, and with a limited resource of 8 gig, there's only so much we could do. But um, GitHub's, GitHub has the ability to add your own runners. Um, there's some quite big advantages. Um, they are, those runners are only for use by the Airflow project. So we know what's running on them. We know we're not competing with anyone else. Um, you can use bigger machines. Um, so we settled, we tried a couple of different sizes, but we settled on one with. Eight gigabytes of RAM um, that we then immediately carve half that off to use as tempfs because um, doing lots of building or lots of tests, resetting things um, by having your tests never touch disk and only operate in, in RAM speed things speeds things up a lot, um, particularly Docker builds. So if your entire Docker bar lib Docker is backed by a tempfs, your builds are much quicker. Um, so that had things a lot. Um, also, because we had these beefy machines with you know lots of CPUs and RAM, we also inside a single job in Airflow we use GNU Parallel to run multiple kind of like multiple flavors of tests. They're kind of like sub matrices. Uh, we've got the API, the UI, core, etc. We run all some of those in parallel when we can, which massively cut down the the test time. So that's the, the plus. Like, yay, self-hosted runs are great. The bad thing. You've got to, you have to run it. Um, you know, with GitHub, they all manage it. They've got all the automation. They make sure it's updates. Um, Self-hosted runners, um, you install a daemon on your own machine, and you have to make sure it stays up, that it's secure, that you don't leak any states and have um, to debug failures. Um, that last one, surprisingly difficult to iron out all the cases. Um, so yeah. Also, big one, security. Um, because the workflow for a pull request comes from that pull request, you can't trust it. So the approach we've taken is um, in the Airflow project, we only allow permitters or PMC members to run jobs on the self-hosted runners. Um, you two, we've also so like, that's just so it's just like this kind of attack. Showing the image won't work. Um, the 
other thing we do, which is kind of an optimization, is we we build our Docker images for our test. So like, we use Docker for the CI. We build those images for PRs on um, on our self-hosted runners, which at first might sound like it's a security risk, but um, through some a little bit of clever tricks, we use the build scripts from the main branch, but the contents of it, like the Docker contents from the PR branch. So modulo any container escape vulnerabilities, which it's going to happen at some point. That you know, Docker is not a perfect security thing, but modulo any vulnerabilities like that, it's kind of safe. And this way, we can get quick builds um, that we know is not going to be so that yeah, quick builds both in terms of time and in terms of queue length. Um, but then the the tests take a little bit longer, but they run on GitHub's infrastructure, so that we don't have to worry about someone trying to mine Bitcoin, and we let GitHub have to deal with that particular headache. Um, but because which runner to use comes from the, the workflow file itself, i.e. that runs on self-hosted, someone in a PR could change it. Um, and GitHub runners, GitHub Actions as a product, does not currently have a way of saying only these people can run on these runners. Uh, and we kind of try to put pressure on GitHub using whatever we can, going, like, hey, we want this, cool. And in the end, I just act around in my, with my rusty C-sharp knowledge and added it. You can, if you care, you can look at the, the PR. Um, and at this point, Airflow is carrying a fork of the run. Well, I am, but Airflow is. Um, we use that, and it basically checks. Here, it, it's got, like, in the config for the, for the runner, it's like, here's a list of people you know, if the PR is not open by one of these people, just reject. Like, don't even do anything with the run. Don't process the YAML file any further. Um, which is just kind of a last line of defense to make sure that no one, really, no one else can do it. Um, GitHub keep. I opened a PR and going, hey, I built this. Does, does GitHub want it? And I was like, eh, it's not really the right. They're like, we're going to build a better solution. Um, I think it was coming. They, they said within three months about. 15 months ago. So, go figure. Um, yeah, so that's kind of like some of the security things. Um, a lot of this is just high level detail. We're going to create um, some blog posts that will detail a lot more of this in detail. Um, but yeah, some of the things we, we optimize to get the hour plus build times down to 15 or 20 minutes. Um, building Docker images once. Um, just because you yeah, have 40, 40 matrix jobs, if each one of those builds that, it's a lot of CPU building the same thing to build once at the start. Um, caching the Docker images, um, we use GitHub's package registry. It's had two different variation flavors, but we use that especially because they are close to, close to the infrastructure. Uh, Docker Hub, particularly with a Docker hating OSS um, source, uh, uh, hating OSS and putting limits on things. Um, we decided let's just not use that. So we, we pushed to package registry as a cache. Um, Cancelling of duplicate jobs. So if you push thing and then push a fix up two seconds later, previously it would run both of those to completion, which was a waste. Um, so we, we've got that. Initially, we had to write some custom things to go query the API, find all the stuff, and then GitHub added a native feature. Um, this is kind of a story, which is, GitHub Actions is still evolving. They're still adding lots of nice features and fixing a lot of these pain points. So if you looked at GitHub Actions before, look at it again, because it's, it's much better. Um, Canceling the whole workflow, um, similar sort of thing. Yeah, if, if one of the early, like if the static typing checks fail, because, hey, you've got a syntax error, there's no point trying the rest of the stuff. So if those fail, we've got a few key jobs. If those fail, the entire rest of the pipeline has failed. There's no point running them, because we know it's going to fail. Um, Running a subset of the full matrix is a big time saver. It would be better from a kind of like purity point of view if we could run the full matrix of jobs on every commit, but it just takes too long. Um, and so we, we pick one Python version with one version of MySQL, Postgres, and SQLite rather than the full six and kind of four Python versions. And we run that on PR unless kind of like we add a label on a job if it needs full tests. 
like basically like sometimes you'll get a much shorter build, but speed of cycle time of feedback is much more important. Um, we also don't run all the tests. If we know that you've only changed the front end asset files, there's no point rerunning any of the Python, Python tests because they're just not going to change. Um, and yeah, just make sure things are cached properly. Um, just yeah, pre commit. We use pre commit for a lot of our MyPy update kind of, you know, the, the static checks, the, the linting, things like that. Um, we're right, running out of time, so I'm just going to speed up. Um, the infrastructure for Airflow CI is sponsored, was sponsored by Airflow. That's right. Yeah, we sponsored it ourselves. No, it was sponsored by AWS. They gave us a few thousand dollars of credits, which we burnt through in a few months because we weren't that careful about what we were spending. We then went, ooh, and took a little bit more um, of a look and kind of put better me measures in place. So if you're going to do this yourself, here are some things you can do. Um, thank you very much to AWS and also my company, Astronomer, for sponsoring Airflow's CI bill. Um, for in if anyone's interested, Apparently, Airflow spends about five hundred and fifty dollars a month on AWS, so it's not that big a bill, bill all told. Um, we could increase it if we wanted more parallelism, but it it's it works with the level we got for now. Um, what was what was the challenge about this? Um, the hardest thing of like running this was running our own self hosted runners was um, making sure the environment was clean between each test so that state left from one run didn't leak or affect or, you know, cause failures in a downstream job. Um, the obvious way of doing that is each test starts with a fresh instance, but that slows down your tests by a minute or two. So it's kind of a trade-off there. Um, having to maintain this fork of runners, I do not like doing it. I would be perfectly happy to delete it and never, never have to touch it again. But um, it's with security. And we just kind of without it, GitHub say, like, don't run... Don't use self hosted runners on a public repo. Like they still have this prominently in their docs because they haven't fixed it. And it's like, well, take, here's a fix, just take it. They don't want to. Um, the, the, the GitHub Actions runner that had kind of itself updates, um, but currently that means it would update to the unpatched version. So we have to keep, keep on top of that to make sure it doesn't happen. Um, there's been a problem where kind of like trying to get being shut down without like, killing it when there's a job in progress. There's lots of Facts and checks and measures we have put in place. Um, GitHub have just added a new ephemeral self hosted runners flag. Um, but it's, we haven't worked out yet whether we as an Apache project can use it given the missions that um, ASF delegate to us as, as kind of projects, project leads. So we don't have admin on our own repo, which most everyone else talking about GitHub Actions does. Um, so where are we now? Nothing is perfect. I mean, it's software, but there's, Nothing is perfect. Um, we're looking at running in Kubernetes. Um, as I say, would love to not have to maintain a fork, my own fork of the actions runner. Um, and I promise there is going to be a series of blog posts on the exact details of kind of all of this, um, the optimizations, building the runner, that kind of stuff, how it works. So that you're just interested, or if you're another Apache project and want to do it, how we did it. Um, it will be on that link in the next coming weeks. Um, I think we've got time for a couple of questions if anyone's got any. Um, yes, hit us up. Yeah, so just the, for those who didn't uh, follow the, the chat, uh, it, it was really the case that people started using this, uh, these vulnerabilities, or vulnerability, the possibility of opening a fork and mining Bitcoin. So that was the main reason why in April, uh, GitHub Actions introduced the approve to run. When you are a new committer or new to the GitHub, uh, you need to get approval from the maintainer to run your PR actions a work workflow. Uh, and that's annoying a little bit because we have to remember doing that for new committers. But on the other hand, uh, that prevents uh, from <laughs> trying to mine Bitcoin or, or cryptocurrency by uh, by automated systems who were doing that. That was that was really that that, that actually happened. So you know the, this protection is absolutely necessary. Cool. All right. 
So cool. If there are no more questions, thank you very much. Uh, thank you Ash, for call and speaking. <laughs> thank you very much. And, uh, yeah. yeah. Great. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks.